So, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone, uh, especially here the lecturers of uh, international law and law of the sea. It is an honor to have uh, Prof. Eti Agus and then also we have uh, Pak Idris uh, and also uh, to have Pak Egeri and Bu Klorin. And also uh, here we have uh, students uh, of uh, uh, faculty of law. Uh, in addition to faculty of law, we also have uh, students from uh, faculty of social and political sciences and also faculty of uh, fisheries and marine affairs. Uh, before we start the uh, uh, session, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Pak Idris as the Dean of the uh, Faculty of Law of uh, Unisas Pai Jajaran to uh, give some remarks. Pak Idris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon here. Good morning in your uh, country, uh, Prof. Lee Smith. Okay, uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for us, for me, for our, my college, our, my uh, student attending uh, the extraordinary international uh, online lecture will be given by uh, the experts, uh, the judge of uh, International Tribunal for the Sea, uh, properly spread uh, inside uh, Maastricht uh, University. So uh, this is not only interesting for me, but also for uh, the full uh, participant. So again, uh, Prof. Lismet, thank you. Maybe the, his lecture uh, is uh, starting to uh, make us uh, uh, join uh, in our uh, subject in terms of the sea. And also maybe we can contact you also from my old student to conduct uh, continuous our research. So please, uh, uh, happy uh, brother and sister audience, uh, participant, uh, student, please explore the substance, uh, the up topic, because this topic is interesting. This was settlement in the law of the sea, uh, part uh, 15 and close. Uh, so far, uh, there are 29 lists of uh, cases decided by, decided by uh, it laws, yeah. But uh, some uh, major of the cases is reflecting uh, from release, yeah, from release, uh, 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 IP sing, IP sing. So this is an interesting topic because uh, some of us students are interesting to write uh, that one of the topic relating to the IP sing or uh, from release cases. But uh, in, in your topic, your uh, country, uh, Prof. Lismet, Okay, uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for us, for me, for our, my college, our, my uh, student, attending uh, the extraordinary international uh, online lecture will be given by uh, the experts, uh, the judge of uh, International Tribunal for the uh, Sea, Prof. Lisbeth Linsad, uh, Maastricht uh, University. So uh, this is not only interesting for me, but also for uh, the full uh, participant. So again, uh, Prof. Lismet, thank you. Maybe the, his lecture uh, is uh, starting to uh, make us uh, uh, join uh, in our uh, subject and also of the sea. And also maybe we can contact you also from my old student to conduct uh, continuous our research. So please, uh, a happy uh, brother and sister audience, uh, participant, uh, student. Please explore the substance, uh, the up topic, because this topic is interesting. This was settlement in the law of the sea, uh, part uh, 15 and close. Uh, so far, uh, there are 29 lists of uh, cases decided by decided by uh, it laws, yeah. But uh, some uh, major of the cases is reflecting uh, from release, yeah, from release. Uh, 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 IP sing, IP sing. So this is an interesting topic because uh, some of us students are interesting to write uh, that one of the topic relating to the IP sing or uh, from Lewis cases. But uh, in your topic now, maritime dispute, maritime uh, boundaries, and, 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 and so on. So anyway, uh, okay, again, thanks so much. Enjoy the lecture, uh, student, and please uh, uh, continue from this bed. Thank you again. Thank you uh, very much, Fidris, uh, for your remarks. Uh, before uh, we start the lecture, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, honorable speaker for today, uh, Professor and Judge Lisbeth Lineset. Uh, she has been the member of the uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea since uh, 2017. 
and she earned her master's degree from uh, University of Amsterdam in 1988 and uh, PhD from Maastricht University in 1994. Uh, before joining the uh, tribunal, she was the uh, legal advisor and head of the uh, international law department of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of the Netherlands from 2006 to 2017. And she is also now a professor of uh, practice of international law uh, in Maastricht University from uh, 2011. She has participated in so many negotiations in the field of international law and the law of the sea. Uh, she was the, uh, also the president of the uh, International Seabed Authority in 2000, uh, for example, and also she was the uh, co-chair of the uh, United Nations General Assembly ad hoc working group on uh, marine biodiversity beyond uh, national jurisdiction. Uh, she has also published um, extensive uh, articles uh, and book chapters in the field of uh, international law and the law of the sea. Uh, so, uh, Lisbeth, I, I, perhaps I should also inform you that this very day, uh, the 21st of April in Indonesia, here we are celebrating, uh, we call it a Kartini Day, which is uh, in which we celebrate uh, women emancipation or women empowerment. So I guess your presence here uh, is a celebration for all of us. We also have Professor Eti Agus, Buklorin, and also all um, uh, female students here in, in the class. So uh, we are, uh, in addition to having your uh, lecture, we are also celebrating um, women emancipation or women empowerment in our own style, if you wish. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Lisbeth. You have the screen. Uh, we will be having uh, your lecture until uh, about uh, five uh, o'clock in our Indonesian time. So there will be a 12 o'clock your time. And uh, after that, we'll be having some questions and answers for 30 minutes. Uh, Professor Lisbeth Lineset, everyone, please. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me on this special day. I didn't know it was Women's Day in Indonesia today. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, of course, I cannot see all of you, but I think many people have already joined. And uh, let's start with what I want to speak about, which is the subject matter of uh, dispute settlement in the Law of the Sea Convention. Now, uh, just briefly, by way of introduction, and also for all the non-lawyers in the audience, um, I want to take you briefly, quickly, through the history of the Law of the Sea Convention. Now, that convention is from 1982, but in order to fully understand it, we need to look at the history of uh, the convention, how it came into being. Now, for a very, very long time, the law of the sea was really only customary law. So that means it was unwritten law where states would be aware of the rules and the rules were formulated on the basis of practice at sea that went together with opinio juris, as we lawyers call it, with the conviction that a particular practice was not only practice, but it was a binding practice. Now, increasingly over time, as navigation grew and the use of the oceans uh, extended and more states started to be seafaring nations and there was a general increase in shipping and fishing and all sorts of other activities that uh, take place uh, at sea, it became necessary for the world community to start writing down the rules. Once you write down the rules, it is easier for all to uh, operate on the basis of the same rules. Uh, by formulating conventions, you create, in a way, a level playing field because everybody has access to the rules, not just the diplomats and the Navy personnel who will know the rules as customary laws, but at the same time, academics and anyone in society who is interested will be able to have access to those rules. So in 1958, the United Nations managed to formulate four separate conventions relating to different aspects of the law of the sea. These are four separate conventions and 
they leave out bits and pieces of the law. They are the four conventions that you see on the screen. And they just deal with a number of chapters of the law of the sea. It's not a full collection of all the rules because that was not polit politically possible at that time. These four conventions go together with a protocol uh, on the compulsory settlement of disputes, but uh, although I see it's in a bit, a bit of a bigger letter type, this was not a great success. Very few states accepted the protocol. The same was the case for the four conventions. They were not universally accepted. And uh, the system implied that you could be party to one of the convention, conventions and, and not be party to the others. So in the sense of creating a worldwide system of law, formulating the law of the sea uh, that would bind all of the nations, that was not achieved in 1958. In terms of looking at disputes, um, if in, at that time you had a, uh, a difficulty, a problem, a dispute with another state that, uh, dealt, that dealt with the law of the sea, there was no, not a very structured way of addressing that dispute. It would be possible to go to the International Court of Justice in The Hague or go to arbitration if you could find a jurisdictional basis for that. So that would be, that would mean looking at the availability of the consent somewhere of your opponent to a procedure that created the possibility of taking the dispute to a judge at a court or a tribunal to uh, adjudicate your dispute. So by and large, that is an unsatisfactory system because problems may arise without a final method of solving the problem. Uh, now talking about problems, um, the idea in the 1970s, of course, was we will draft one big convention. It was clear that the system with the four conventions was unsatisfactory many things were left out. And it, the idea was we need more coherence in the whole system. We need to write everything down in one large treaty. That was not an easy process. It took a long time, more or less nine to 10 years, long negotiations to end up with what is now the Law of the Sea Convention of 1982. I will not go into the detail of those negotiations, but they were not only long, they were complex because the states around the table had very different interests. And um, during the negotiations, it was clear that interests in one area had to somehow be related to interests in the other area, because as was often said, Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and a way to achieve that is through the consensus process. Consensus process does not necessarily mean that everybody is happy with the result, but we can live with it because on the points that are of crucial importance to my delegation, we have achieved the best we thought we could get. And that is the case for all other delegations as well, although everybody's interests are different. So we now have the 1982 convention with 320 articles and uh, rest assured, even for me as a judge, I don't know them all by heart. And the convention also has nine annexes and it deals with almost everything, but not quite because as the convention ages and time progresses, we are finding that some contemporary issues are unfortunately not included and need to be dealt with separately. So new developments or developments that had not been on anyone's mind in the 1970s or issues that we are aware of now due, due to technological developments, those are not included and we have to do work to cater for those new problems. 
also, unfortunately, not all states are parties. I think at the moment there is something like 167 states. Um, and the, the, the odd ones out, some of them are not really to worry about. Liechtenstein, very small state, not on the coast, no shipping registry. But places like the US, Israel, Turkey, Venezuela, and a number of others uh, are not states party to the convention. That's a pity. It would be best, I would think, uh, if we try to achieve uh, universal uh, 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 rule through the convention, because all the states in the world would be party. But I think by now there is a large amount, a huge amount of states actually covered by the con uh, convention. Just to mention to you, um, uh, and we're not, not discussing deep seabed mining at the moment, there is, uh, it was necessary to create an implementing agreement in 1994 for the convention to enter uh, into force. So this in, uh, an, uh, implementing agreement from 94 is amending in fact, part 11 of the convention on the law of the sea about deep seabed mining. Okay, now we move towards dispute settlement. Um, so as I told you, uh, the convention, uh, is based on extensive and long negotiations that are based on consensus. And consensus as a mechanism for decision-making uh, more or less uh, requires flexibility from all delegations to be flexible on points that are perhaps of not, not such great interest to you as a state uh, and to be willing to agree with a compromise. So um, if you go through the literature, particularly at the time of the conclusion of the convention in 1982, um, the authors are really stressing something like this was the best possible achievement that we could reach, reach at this time. And they would point to something that they felt was particularly important, such as uh, finding a solution for deep seabed mining or the archipelagic states got a recognition for the status of archipelagic state, which it, from their perspective was an important achievement. So there is something in the convention for everybody, depending on uh, your political interests, but also depending on your geography and your connection with the ocean, which is different depending on where you are from. Now, the need for a proper dispute settlement system is very much related to this consensus solution. Because if you start changing something about one element of the consensus, the whole construction may start to fall down. So dispute settlement was seen as a necessary element in terms of ensuring the stability of the system. This is looking at the convention as a system. Uh, and for, for, the, for that to, to, to be achieved, dispute settlement had to be compulsory. That was the thinking. However, they were facing uh, quite a major issue because views differed a lot about how dispute settlement should be organized. So for instance, the group of 77, the developing countries were very dissatisfied with the International Court of Justice in the 1970s. They felt that the court was very old fashioned and that it was very Western, that they, they felt unrepresented in, in the, uh, in the uh, ICJ, not just in terms of who were the judges that were uh, working at the International Court of Justice, but also in terms of their case law. So for them, it was necessary to have a new court. That's the background of the creation of the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Another group, the more traditionalist states said, well, we, have, we are happy with the International Court of Justice and we have been happy with the court, International Court of Justice, they have, already in the 1970s, quite a lot of relevant case law for us. So uh, we think they have done well. What's wrong with the ICJ? Let's keep the ICJ uh, uh, in, in the dispute settlement. And then there was a third group of states who said, well, you know, for us, sovereignty is of such importance. 
we cannot accept anything else than arbitration. Uh, arbitration, as you may know, is a form of dispute settlement that leaves quite a, a lot of space um, for the role of the individual states. Uh, individual states have quite a lot of influence on the procedure and the establishment of the arbitral tribunal. Now, um, so there are essentially three groups in that, uh, in that negotiation and what they do, the Law of the Sea conference is taking place in Geneva. And one weekend they go to a place called Montreux, which is on the other side of Lake Geneva. And they spend a weekend talking about dispute settlement and what they do is they come home with what has now become Article 287 of the Convention. And this article, in fact, does two things. Um, dispute settlement is, it tells us, dispute settlement is compulsory and it offers us a multiple choice system. Now, that's interesting. So by uh, by proclaiming that it is that there is always going to be dispute settlement available, of course, depending on going through all the steps. Huh? First, if you have a dispute, you have to sort it out yourself. You have to talk to your opponent. You have to go through diplomatic exchanges. You have to make an effort at solving your own problem before you go to a judge. Um, but 287 presents us with just to the four, well, four options uh, of which I will not discuss special uh, arbitration. It's a mystery what that procedure is about. It has not been used so far. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go into that, but it tells us um, we have four options. The important ones being the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. You can also go to the International Court of Justice and you can go to an arbitral tribunal. And states are free to choose from this list. Either they make a choice when they ratify the convention or they make a choice at some time after that. And it is always possible to change your declaration when you have had second thoughts or you had a better idea and you want to change your choice. Of course, when you have the option of four procedures, and, and I, as I have indicated on the screen, this is the content of Article 287, and then Annex 6 takes you to the details for the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, and further details are in the rules of the Tribunal. And the, the structure and the detail of the arbitral procedure is in Annex 7, uh, for the ICJ, of course, we already have the ICJ statute, so there's nothing to regulate for that. But in a multiple choice system, there is, of course, a possibility that my state has chosen option A, it lost, and your state has chosen the International Court of Justice. So that's the problem of different choices. We have each chosen a different forum or your opponent has not made a choice at all. It's not obligatory to make a choice. You may make a choice according to paragraph one of uh, article 287, but there is no obligation to make a choice. So um, there is a further rule which tells us if one of the two parties has not made a choice, the dispute is going to go to arbitration or if we have made different choices the dispute is going to go to arbitration. That means that arbitration is always the default procedure, that means this is always the applicable procedure in case there is not a uniform choice between the claimant and the defendant. And to facilitate this, there is a list of arbitrators where each state party may submit a maximum of four qualified individuals that are available to act as arbitrators. Now I put the 
the smiley there or the non-smiley, because obviously this means that there are many cases that could have gone to the tribunal, but do not go to the tribunal because as a consequence of um, uh, part uh, of, of um, part three or um, um, paragraph three and paragraph five of article 287, they go to arbitration. It's sad, but that's how it is. Now, um, these default arbitrations always lead to binding awards. So there is going to be an arbitral decision and they also lead to binding awards when your defendant for whatever reason has determined that they are not going to participate. Unfortunately, that is something that has been happening on a regular basis over the past 10 years. So for instance, in South China Sea, China's not appearing, Arctic Sunrise, Russia's not appearing, three Ukrainian naval vessels, that's the most recent one, Russia not appearing. Now, the beauty of this system, I would say, because it is a very well thought out system, is that the president of the tribunal is able to appoint an, uh, arbit an arbiter, an arbitrator, um, when the claimant doesn't do so. So the mere fact that the defendant is not participating does not in itself stop the procedure. That is important also from the perspective of wanting to provide a more or less complete and compulsory system of dispute settlement. If the defendant does not appear and after a certain number of time limits, the president of the tribunal may be requested to appoint arbitrators. That's an important thing. Uh, this is the role of the appointing authority, which I think is uh, also in academic literature, a role that is sort of undervalued. It, it is a very important um, stop gap in the system. There is always going to be somebody who can contribute to the completion of the arbitral tribunal when, for whatever reason, defendant does not participate. And we cannot make the defendant participate. And that's if that's what they decide, that's what they decide. Now, to organize everything in these arbitrations, um, states very often refer to the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which will then host the arbitration and more or less act as a registry, including for all these default procedures. So, um, now I'm turning to the Law of the Sea Tribunal and, uh, and Annex 6, which is the statute of the tribunal. Uh, and this is an overview of the types of cases that, uh, you, that we can have at the tribunal. Contentious cases, you know, state A versus state B. Um, we have two specific urgent procedures that are specific to the tribunal. Um, and I'll focus about uh, on those two uh, in, in, the, um, in, in the following. Provisional measures pending the constitution of an arbitral tribunal. This is all Article 290 of the Convention. And the prompt release procedures. Those two procedures uh, are unique to the tribunal. Another unique one, but in a completely different field, um, is the CBETS dispute chamber, which has unique jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction, more or less exclusive jurisdiction, I would say, about deep seabed mining and the work of the International Seabed uh, Authority. And then there is advisory jurisdiction, either specifically for the international seabed uh, cases relating to the deep seabed mining uh, and, and International Seabed Authority, as well as advisory uh, jurisdiction in cases where um, that is um, external, um, I need to reformulate that, advisory jurisdiction by the full tribunal, not just the CBETS dispute chamber, but by the full tribunal in a situation where there is a request from an international organization, such as is described in, the, in case uh, 21, where um, a request came from a, the sub-regional fisheries commission 
which deals with fisheries off the coast of West Africa. Now, um, I'm, I'd like to continue with addressing these um, urgent proceedings to start out with the provisional measures. Now, provisional measures are essentially measures that you um, request from a tribunal in a situation where something is needed now. It's very much like an injunction action in domestic uh, litigation. Something is necessary. You, you want the judges to dis determine something, to prevent something, to uh, stop something happening, or to give an order in what is essentially a case that is more or less either ongoing or that is likely to start soon. Now, um, first of all, uh, let me point you to the fact that the ICJ also provides for a provisional measures procedure so that uh, in a sense, uh, there is or there was already a lot of practice from the ICJ when the tribunal started. I'll unmute myself. I hope I'm still understandable. Good. Now, uh, so, so this is not starting from scratch. Uh, there is a procedure which is in the uh, ICJ statute. Um, let me see. I think it's um, Article 41 in the ICJ statute. Sorry, I didn't put it on the slide, but if you want to compare. Um, uh, so the, the measure is not invented for the tribunal, that's what I meant to say. And for a long time, it was possible in the ICJ to obtain uh, an indication of provisional measures, even if there was not yet a case before the ICJ. Now, um, I hope uh, you have brought the uh, convention with you. If you look at Article 290, Paragraph 1, that's the first version of provisional measures. It's, it's more or less the traditional version. So that's a situation in which a case has already been submitted to the tribunal. Um, so the case already exists, but there has not yet been a determination in the mainline case. I think Roseanne calls it mainline case. So the, the case itself has not yet been decided, it is still in the procedure, and then there is a reason, whatever reason, um, for uh, a party to ask, to ask for provisional measures, um, and they submit the request for provisional measures to the court or arbitral tribunal where that case is sitting. So it is an incidental procedure. It is related to the mainline case, and something happens and you think, ah, for instance, for instance, let me give you a simple example. The case is about um, your neighbors having uh, a building a, uh, a factory, an industrial plant near a river and the river runs into your territory. And your mainline case is about, I think this factory is going to be hugely polluting. So you want to stop your neighbors from building that factory. But then all of a sudden you hear that uh, the factory is planning to release a lot of polluted water next week. And that's what you want to stop. So you're trying to stop something that is related to the main case and there is an urgency. You need to stop it now. Okay, that's the procedure in Article 291, which has not been used all that often. There are, I think, three or four cases under Article 2, uh, 290, Paragraph 1. The more important one is the procedure in Article 295, uh, 290, Paragraph 5. And this is the procedure uh, you're pending the constitution of an arbitral tribunal. Now, this uh, procedure provided in Article 290, Paragraph 5, in fact, follows from Article 287. So if through the functioning of Article 287, you end up 
with the dispute before an arbitral tribunal, it is going to take quite some time to set up this arbitral tribunal. Um, I've been engaged in a procedure like that. It will, because an arbitral tribunal is not a permanent institution, you will have to establish the tribunal. I have to pick my arbitrator, the opponent has to pick their arbitrator. We need to get in touch with the permanent court of arbitration. We need to establish the procedural rules. We have to ensure that the other three arbitrators are appointed. We have to have a discussion about uh, the salary of the arbitrators. These things take time. So on average, on average, I would say, sorry. Okay. On average, uh, it takes three to four months at least to set up this arbitral tribunal. Aha. Uh -huh. But what happens if something urgent takes place in those four months? It's clear that there is a dispute, but in those four months, there is nobody, there would not be anybody, uh, of, from whom to request provisional measures. Now, that is the remedy that Article 290, Paragraph 5, provides. And if you look at the text, it is a lot of, it's a lot of complicated writing, I would say. But still, um, if you have started the arbitration, so you have announced to your counter counterpart that the um, arbitration, that you intend to um, uh, uh, start an arbitration against them and then two weeks later if there is something you think is crucially important and urgent you will be able to bring a request for provisional measures to the international tribunal for the law of the sea the aim of such a request would be can be according to article 290 it has to do with either the preservation of your rights in the dispute. So something is happening that I think is going to be dangerous. It's going to be um, uh, dangerous for my rights in the mainline case, or my opponents are going to do something that is uh, going to be very detrimental to the marine environment. And so I am claiming on account of the need to prevent serious harm to the marine environment. The order of the tribunal in provisional measures will be binding, that is, in the interim period until the arbitral tribunal gives the final decision, the final order, uh, or the tribunal or the court. So that's the same thing for provisional measures across the board under uh, Article 290, the order will be binding as long as it lasts. So the provisional measures order will end at the final decision in the case. And it means that the judges or the arbitrators will have had a look at the provisional measure and will have reflected on the need or not to uh, include the substance of that order in the final decision. But there are also situations possible where the um, uh, provisional measures are being revoked or modified during the, uh, the period in which there is not yet uh, a final decision. Uh, and as I said, Article 290, Paragraph 5, uh, we've had nine cases so far out of a total of 29 cases. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a large chunk of the work that the tribunal has done, particularly in this interim period where it is clear that you have a dispute and that you will need to go to arbitration and the tribunal is not yet there. Once the tribunal is there, you move to the situation of um, Article 290, Paragraph 1, because the tribunal, once it is established, will be able to uh, determine provisional measures um, as well. Now, to give you an example, my example with the river, of course, was not a good example in terms of the law of the sea, 
but very often um, you see in um, uh, cases of provisional measures the request to urgently um, release a ship or ur and, and urgently release the crew of that ship. Some of those stories are stories about um, uh, crew sitting locked up on a ship for a very long time. So there is a humanitarian need to let them go home. That's the thinking behind it. Um, and, uh, and, and that that is something you could uh, easily request when you ask for a provisional measure. Um, so to, um, to recap, uh, Article 290, Paragraph 5, builds on arbitration as default procedure. It is sort of uh, the solution um, for the interim period as the tri uh, arbitral tribunal is established. It's a compulsory competence of the tribunal. So uh, it's, it's something you can only get at the tribunal. And if um, this, um, uh, and if such a request is done, the tribunal will normally take it up. It may still be that your case fails because there's no jurisdiction or the case is not admissible, but the, the tribunal will start examining your case. So, and, and it is a self-contained procedure. Once the tribunal is established, it may modify, revoke, affirm any order on provisional measures and will take this into, um, and, and, and will be the master of the provisional measures, if you wish. Now, um, let, let's look a little bit about uh, into the procedure. Huh? So the provisional measures um, will take priority in the work of the tribunal. This is because there is an element of urgency. So in the, I would say, hypothetical situation that the tribunal is extremely busy, um, provisional measures will push aside the other work that the tribunal is doing. Um, now, as I already mentioned, um, uh, if it is a request from a party to a dispute, the dispute is, or uh, that means that the dispute is already before the International Court of Justice or the Law of the Sea Tribunal. But keep in mind, it may be confusing stay in a case that is already before the tribunal. So it's the case from state A versus state B. It may be that state B is the one asking for provisional measure mainline case may end up being the claimant in the request for provisional measures and the claimant in the mainline case then ends up being the defendant so as it may be that states do switch roles in these proceedings um, sometimes that is that is confusing when you read it but um, that's a matter of looking at the origin of the complaint, particularly how the complaint is sitting in the already existing um, dispute before a court or a tribunal. Now, as I said, uh, the text of Article 290, Paragraph 5, is, uh, it's, it's quite bulky. It's a lot of text and it is not necessarily extremely clear. So um, a request for a provisional measure may be made anytime after two weeks after the notification of the arbitration to your opponents. Um, and that implies that what you have to do first is to institute arbitral proceedings. And arbitral proceedings are at the end of diplomatic negotiations in which you have tried to persuade your opponents that they've got it wrong and that you've got it right. At a certain point in time, you determine that, well, this is it. I'm not getting any further. We are at the end uh, of our negotiations. Then you uh, have to prepare your, um, your diplomatic notes and your papers that are essentially already papers for the arbitration. And it indicates, this is my complaint. These are the facts and this is the applicable law, and this is how you violated the law vis-a-vis -vis my interests or the interest of a ship sailing under my flag. And 
these are my requests. I have demands and I'm putting those demands in front of the arbitral tribunal. So in order to get access to the procedure under article 290 paragraph five, what you actually do is you start writing a different document which you need later on for the arbitration. But it has to be, it has to, to have the appropriate quality because once the document is there, it's there. It's part of what you've submitted to the arbitration. Um, and then time keeps ticking and you're thinking this is urgent eh? because if it's not urgent, there is no reason to go to provisional measures. So in the meantime, you're also working on the request for provisional measures. That's not the same as the documents you're writing for the arbitral tribunal because the request for provisional measures is going to have to demonstrate a number of specific elements that we get to on the, nice, uh, on the next slide. So at the end of two weeks after bringing the arbitration, that's the earliest time that you can go to the tribunal with the request for the prescription of provisional measures. So, uh, and I'm speaking here from experience, it, it implies that you're working on two, on two legal documents concerning the same situation, but they are very distinct uh, documents. One is the document to formally start the arbitration procedure, and the other one is the document that will trigger the procedure uh, for, the, uh, um, for the establishment of provisional measures. It's a lot of work in the same time. Oh, well. Now, um, how does this take place uh, in reality? So you have prepared your statement, you have had a good look at all the time limits, you're not too early and you're certainly not too late because this is urgent. You submit a written statement. Mind you, the respondent is not obliged to, uh, to submit a written statement. They may do so, they don't have to. Uh, and that's all because this is an urgent proceeding. Uh, if the respondent may want to focus on their defense, so they may want to focus on the oral phase and let the written phase be. Now, that submission must contain the measures requested, such as I want the ship and the crew released as soon as possible. Um, the reasons for your request. So you would say something like, well, the arrest was contrary to the law of the sea to begin with. And uh, by the way, the crew need to go home. They've now been stuck on, on board for four months. It's much too long. They need to be allowed to go home. You must provide information about the plausibility of rights to clarify that there is a good chance that you're case is going to be admissible. You're complaining about rights that you do have under the Law of the Sea Convention. And then you have to indicate uh, what the cons consequences would be either for your rights or the prevention from the perspective of the prevention of harm to the marine environment if the provisional measures are not granted. And with respect to the preservation of rights, uh, it, it is uh, necessary to indicate um, whether there is a risk of irreparable harm. So you can say, well, this is going to cause harm, but then uh, the tribunal will, if you want the crew and the ship to be released, you would say with respect to the crew. Well, it is a lot of hardship to stay on that ship for so long. And this is something that cannot be repaired. Um, of course, this, this is in, you are uh, describing the facts and giving your interpretation as to whether that particular harm is irreparable. 
Now, if you are in an Article 290 paragraph 5 procedure, so that is whilst we are still waiting for the arbitral tribunal to be established, you also have to indicate um, what would be the grounds for the jurisdiction of that arbitral tribunal. And that is a prima facie text. So you are indicating uh, on account of the rules in Article 290, we need to go to arbitration. Um, we believe that the arbitral, the future arbitral tribunal will have jurisdiction on the basis of, and then you identify where you think the source of arbitration for the tribunal, uh, source of jurisdiction for the tribunal will be, which is a prima facie text, test. So it's not, the tribunal is not going to determine whether the arbitral tribunal has jurisdiction. It has to be demonstrated that this is highly likely on a prima facie first look evaluation uh, of the information. You will have to identify as well what is the urgency and you will have to provide information that you have actually submitted documents for the in institution of the arbitra arbitral procedure. Those are the documents that you were working on alongside the documents for the provisional measures case. Uh, it's obligatory for the tribunal to hold hearings in such a case uh, and the president may request parties to act in such a way that, the, that any order of the tribunal will have the intended effects. So don't make things worse. That's essentially what it says, but that's the, 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 the president has an explicit possibility uh, to do so. Okay, so that was a brief look at the uh, provisional measures procedure. Now, um, I move to, let me see where we are. Briefly, prompt release, Article 292. Um, this is an other urgent procedure, and it is, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, this is a very different type of procedure, but it is urgent as well. And this is really related to a ship that has been arrested um, and is now sitting in port, uh, normally in the port of the arresting state. And uh, the authorities that have arrested the ship are saying, we will only release the ship on the payment of a bond. The rule is prompt release on the payment of a reasonable bond. That's the full rule. Uh, we, we keep saying prompt release, but um, prompt release on the payment of a reasonable bond. So the port state says, well, we arrested your ship. These and these are the infractions. And this is the bond you have to pay. The idea of the bond or the financial guarantee is that by giving the financial guarantee, the state that has arrested the ship will have a also have a guarantee that the ship or the flag state will uh, participate in further court proceedings. Now, the, the background thinking to that is that ships in port are not making any money. Arrested ships cost money for their owner. So the idea is um, the port state asks for a bond, a reasonable bond, and by paying the bond, the ship will be able to go. In order to get your bond back as a ship owner, you will have to go through the procedures in the port state. So it will be before a domestic judge. Prompt release is a case, uh, is a situation dealing with the quality of the domestic procedure. That is what is at stake at the level of the tribunal. So ship is arrested. Uh, the bond is set by set. The bond is set by the port state, and then we end up in a situation about uh, where in which there is disagreement about the bond. So the ship owner would say it's completely unreasonable, uh, or the conditions are unreasonable, and uh, the ship cannot leave unless. The bond is paid, but whatever uh, in the discussions between the port state and the ship owner, uh, no, uh, nothing happens uh, and the ship is still sitting in port. Uh, to briefly keep in mind, this 
procedure is available both for um, fisheries cases and for a number of environmental cases, but so far only fisheries cases have appeared before the have come to the tribunal. Uh, in those cases, the flag state of that fishery ship will take action. Uh, and the central question is going to be whether the arrest and the required bond by the the bond required by the arresting state are violating the rights of the flag state. That's the heart of the procedure. And in that procedure, the tribunal will review the domestic procedure for arrest and release of a particular ship including um, the question as to, is this bond reasonable? Now, reasonable could speak to a number of things. It could speak to the amount of money that is asked. So there is a whopping financial guarantee asked while everyone can see that the ship isn't even worth half that money. Um, sometimes the arresting state uh, re requires a, a, a sum of money, but also requires things like a change of fishing gear, because they think a particular gear uh, is unsatisfactory given the type of fishing that the ship is doing. It's got to do with mesh size or something like that. And there is even a case where the state involved wanted um, the uh, ins uh, installation of a satellite tracking system on the ship and um, there the problem ended up whether such a requirement, the requirement of installing a satellite tracking system on a fishing ship, whether that was anything that could qualify as a reasonable bond. In fact, in, in the eyes of the tribunal, it did not. Now, prompt release was a new procedure uh, in the convention, uh, and it was very much at the heart of uh, initial case law of the tribunal. I believe there's something like eight uh, prompt release cases. But now um, it's been a long time since there have been prompt release cases. As I said, no cases uh, related to uh, infractions of environmental law so far. Um, the general understanding is that this initial bulk of prompt release cases has set the case law and the rules are now clear as to what uh, the tribunal thinks about this uh, matter. So that is probably why we um, have not been hearing more about it. Now, I think we are at the end of my presentation. Yeah, this, this used to have a photograph, but it doesn't anymore. So I think I'm almost at the end of my presentation and maybe I will just stop sharing my screen. Is that okay? And, um, and I'll have another drink of water. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Lisbeth, for your very um, intriguing and insightful uh, lecture. Um, and now we have uh, about 30 minutes uh, for uh, Q&A. So uh, I would like to invite the participants uh, here to uh, ask uh, questions or uh, perhaps also would like to comment on the um, uh, lecture from uh, Professor Lisbeth Lyonset. I have a uh, hand here, uh, Agulardi. Yes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for your presentation. My name is Gulardi. I'm actually not a student of uh, Universitas Pajajaran, but I'm working at the Foreign Ministry, but I'm here in my personal capacity. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, more in a general subject of uh, the judges of it loss, uh, as you have probably known that Indonesia has made uh, two attempts in uh, candidacy in, in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, but so far we have not yet succeeded to land our, our, uh, our candidate to be a judge. Uh, as you yourself have gone through the process, what do you think is actually required of a country as well as of an individual to be let's say eligible to, to sit in this uh, honorable uh, tribunal, because uh, certainly you have, uh, the Netherlands have a number of uh, professors in the law of the sea in which you can just, I mean, you can pick any of, any of the person that uh, 
is a uh, that you yet yeah, that you feel uh, com uh, compatible. Uh, however, in my personal, very personal opinion, Indonesia is still having a uh, quite difficulty. Probably Pak Guzman is uh, is the right person to be one day a candidate before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. But aside from Pak Guzman, we still have to dig very very deep in Indonesia. So, what well, what is your view on this? Thank you. Thank you. Oh dear. Um, now, I, I have great appreciation for uh, uh, Pa Guzman's uh, talents and, and expertise, so I, I'm, I'm always happy to work with him. So let, let, let that be clear. Um, the, the, the problem with those, um, uh, with, with those elections, uh, well, I can tell you stories about that. Also from the perspective of where I, I used to work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, if we if we are um, if we are only lawyers and academics, and you look at the criteria in uh, in, in the convention, uh, there are a number of, uh, of fairly clear criteria. But that is not all. And the convention talks about uh, people, uh, knowledgeable people, experts with uh, high moral norms coming from different geographic regions. And I would add that uh, uh, in my personal experience, it is very useful to have people from uh, quite different regions of the world and with quite different uh, expertise and different experience in issues related not just to the law of the sea, but also to uh, international law in a larger sense uh, uh, and also oceans management in a larger sense to have a, a diverse group of people sitting around the table as judges. However, that is only if you look at it uh, from an academic point of view. Um, elections are highly political. If you um, look at the provision, uh, I, know, I know the provision, but I don't know the number, can't, can't find it quite so fast. Um, the convention already indicates that out of the 21 judges, 21 is quite a lot, huh? the ICJ has 15, International Criminal Court has 18, so we have 21, and we, we're not particularly busy, so there is a bit of a mismatch there, I think. Um, but out of those 21, each of the five regional groups in the UN gets three judges, and then that means you are still left with six further judges, if my uh, arithmetic is right. And there has been an understanding at the level of the meeting of states parties, how those are to be divided. So um, although, although um, the election is an election by the states parties, the heart of the competition is in within your own regional group. Uh, and if there are two vacancies and two candidates, uh, well, that's not rocket science, eh? they both get elected. If there are two vacancies and two candidates, the disadvantage of that is that states who take the selection of judges seriously do not, do not make a choice. And the same thing goes for regional organizations who would give their seal of approval to a particular candidate. If that means that everybody is going to vote for the candidate candidate of far away land because we all thought it was far away land's turn um, then that takes away this possibility of evaluating whether this is the right person for the job i'm from a tradition where uh, the netherlands used to be quite precise about is this this is a, is this a knowledgeable person how would this person fit into the general uh, in the general perspective. Um, does this person bring a knowledge that is perhaps somewhat broader than just law of the sea or just international criminal law? And to give you an example, um, in uh, three Ukrainian naval vessels, um, one of the more recent cases, it really touches, it gets very close to the law of naval warfare. So it helps if you have an understanding about that rather than only uh, UNCLOS. Um, and at the same time, you know, we do treaty interpretation, lots of them. We get into um, diplomatic immunities, uh, other immunities, see Enrique Alexi case. So um, 
in terms of evaluating whether a person is the right candidate, uh, I would like to think we're looking for experts. The reality is that there is a lot of horse trading going on. Uh, I'll support your candidate if you support mine. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm very much a supporter of uh, no, end, and, uh, no endless repetition of terms. So one term or maybe two, that should be enough. Um, and from time to time, states have to say to their neighbors and friends in the region, uh, by the way, it's perhaps our time. Uh, could we be the one who is pre presenting the candidate uh, for the vacant Asian seat uh, at the next round? So in, was it two, three years? It's going to be a next election. Um, I'm not sure who's going to leave us then. I don't. I don't have know that by heart. Um, but unfortunately, the process is a very political process. Um, there are lots of things the candidates can do: lovely flowers, <coughs> videos, all of that. But also, um, it is a matter of uh, going to see people, going to talk to people. Uh, and and uh, being known in other circles than just in your own country, I think. In that sense, I had an advantage because I was a diplomat and many of the people involved in voting or uh, reflecting on who should be voted for were people that I knew. But I did travel a great deal during my election campaign. At the same time, I think, you know, one of your unique selling points for whoever is the uh, Indonesian candidate would be to say, hey, we are a state with expertise as an archipelagic state. You're bringing a unique selling point. Huh? My, my campaign team pretended that I was Grosch's granddaughter, which is, of course, not true. But there is a unique selling point to every my neighbor in the tribunal, uh, Judge Cabello, he's from Paraguay and his unique selling point is I'm from a landlocked state. Well, I'm happy to discuss that somewhat further, but maybe let's let's uh, turn to another question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you also, Faguladi, for your question and your compliments. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, yes, please. Uh, anyone else would like to uh, perhaps ask questions to Professor Elizabeth Lineset? Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Elizabeth, um, I'm, uh, well, I actually have uh, two questions related to your uh, presentation, if I may. Uh, the first one, I think uh, it, it is interesting. You, you brought up this um, issue of a prompt release of vessels. And currently in Indonesia, we still uh, are discussing uh, with uh, especially the uh, people from the uh, government and also the lawmakers to have the uh, more uh, perhaps uh, uh, clearer um, uh, laws and regulations regarding the uh, uh, reasonability uh, of the bond. But it is interesting that uh, you mentioned that uh, the issue of um, prompt release uh, and a reasonable, reasonable bond now uh, has come to a standstill. Uh, but uh, what I reckon is that um, there was a case, uh, I think it was uh, the, the Folga case where it was debated the uh, nature of uh, the bond, whether it should be uh, uh, financial or uh, non-financial in nature. And uh, we, we know that uh, from the decision, it was uh, uh, decided to dwell a uh, bond on the covers uh, financial nature. So uh, is there any, uh, I'm just wondering if there is any prospect uh, in the tribunal to perhaps revisit the, uh, the uh, consideration under that uh, case and whether the, the interpretation of the bond will somehow also cover uh, non-financial nature. And uh, the second Second question, I guess, is um, as a relatively new uh, tribunal, um, there, there's so much hope for, for it lost. Uh, and as you mentioned, it has uh, contributed uh, significantly in uh, not only cases related to the law of the CS 
it, it is in UNCLOS, but there is also a relation uh, with, as you mentioned, the uh, Ukrainian vessels case uh, with, with the law of uh, naval warfare. So I'm just wondering if there is also a prospect uh, in the ITLO somehow for uh, cases, for instance, related to the uh, uh, ocean and climate change, maybe. Uh, in the future. So uh, maybe uh, we would be happy to hear your observation uh, in this area. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, the, the, those are quite the two quite different cases. Um, now, of course, we always, when we look at a tribunal or a court, we always have to keep in mind that they are passive. Um, we can only provide you with interesting case law if uh, states provide us with interesting cases. Um, and it is generally considered to be um, not, not very appropriate for courts to go actively hunting for cases. Bring your case to me of the best case. That's not what you do. Uh, at the same time, very often there will be informal discussions in which uh, the president or the registrar or the judges um, would inform states of, well, have you considered taking your issue to the tribunal? These are the possibilities. These are the, the, the procedural tools that you may have to bring your dispute uh, before the tribunal. And uh, sometimes there are issues where states have been on and on and on against each other and nothing happens. And there may be, uh, there is some benefit in solving your problems. And the other thing is that from a political perspective, it may be uh, useful to go to court because then you can always say, well, it was the judges that did it. It wasn't us, it was the court that did it. And we are a respectable state and we stick by what the judges have ordered. This is, the, and there are a few uh, court cases where if you look at the, the political background, uh, that works. Um, so um, the, the fact that the prompt release cases before the tribunal seem to have stopped does not mean that they have stopped uh, in domestic uh, legis uh, domestic situations. Huh? We, we um, um, the staff at the tribunal provide us on a regular basis with an overview of this type of situations that includes something about um, this was the ship, this was the infraction, this was the crime, if you wish, uh, and this was this, the, the amount of the bond. That's very interesting. So there is a lot of practice out there. I'm not sure if that leads us in a particular direction. With respect to um, non-monetary uh, requirements for the release of a ship, um, yeah, the, I think there is there there is case law that points to the fact that um, uh, any anything non-monetary is not a bond, uh, which uh, I think at the time was not very well received by a number of academics and certainly not by a number of NGOs. And and uh, the tribunal is aware of that. Can I stick to that? Um, as to your other question. Um, about uh, yeah um, ab about dealing with issues that are somewhat outside of the direct content of the convention, uh, whether environmental, whether naval warfare, etc. Uh, the starting point is that it has to be related to um, the content of the convention, but it may or, but that may mean a connection with other relevant. Uh, legislation. Now, um, with respect to the law of naval warfare, which I find an interesting subject, I think that's probably why I mentioned it. Um, if you look at the contemporary state of the law of naval warfare, it's not very clear. Huh? We have the San Remo manual, which is, be, which is being updated. Um, and initially, when the San Remo manual was drafted, uh, and this is also in the introduction to the manual, um, the authors had in mind to also look for the connection between the Law of the Sea Convention and the Law of Naval Warfare. 
but then uh, and and they did and now I think some parts of of, of, um, of the San Remo manual are being reconsidered and things such as what exactly is the meaning for maritime of the maritime zones and the rules in the maritime zones for the scope of uh, naval warfare crucial question um, at the same time I also note that naval warfare is not really on the agenda of states the conventions are fairly old huh? 1907 etc so it's been a while um, and depending on where you stand politically you could argue well it's very clear that naval warfare is completely excluded by the convention or you could say well you know it's, uh, it's the same sea yeah so um, we have to see how the connection actually functions um, can I leave it at that to give everybody the opportunity? Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, we already uh, have here a question uh, from uh, Fafa, uh, one of my uh, students here in uh, Pajajaran University. Um, she would like to ask how um, how is your experience in dealing with the cases uh, in this uh, pandemic situation? Uh, do you have uh, have to handle it uh, remotely or do you still have to come to uh, Hamburg and have a, a court proceeding or a hearing? Well, um, briefly, the, the case, um, I think that's case 29, or the 28, I'm not sure. Um, Mauritius Maldives or Maldives Mauritius, that's a chamber case. I'm not in that, I am not in that chamber. Um, but that was held working uh, remotely. And the tribunal has had two administrative sessions since the lockdown started. And this means that those of us who can travel actually come to Hamburg, which is no fun at all because Hamburg has a tighter lockdown than the Netherlands. Um, and it means that we now have our meetings in the courtroom because that's the only place where we can sit with two meters apart. Um, but the consequence is that we get maybe half of the work done, maybe one third of the work done, because everybody who is still at home, and this is from Japan, Thailand, India on, on the one hand side, and Mexico and Chile on the other hand side, it means that there is actually not very much time at which everybody is awake. So we work from, I think, from, from 12 to four, maybe, or one o'clock to four, Whereas a normal workday for the tribunal would be from, from 10 to 1 and then from 3 to 6 um, with extensive lunches, etc. So we are not quite as productive. What I would add is that the tribunal has changed its rules of procedure recently to deal with uh, uh, distance working, similar to the steps taken by the ICJ. Okay, uh, thank you, Lisbeth. Uh, we still have uh, time for, uh, I think, here yeah, um, about uh, 10 minutes, and we still have uh, a question here from uh, Benita. Uh, she's wondering if you ever face a situation uh, in dealing with the case and, and you have a deadlock. So uh, she's wondering if you have had that kind of uh, experience. And how would you compare between the role of uh, perhaps uh, ITLOS and ICJ in dealing with um, cases on the law of the sea and especially the uh, settlement uh, of uh, maritime boundaries dispute? Um, well, uh, judges uh, disagree, yeah? Um, and we do so behind closed doors. So you never know who disagreed with what, which is good. So we saving for us. Um, but there is a solution in the rules of procedure. And if there is, there is never really a deadlock, we're 21 judges. So if everybody is there, there is always going to be a majority, even if it may be a very small majority. Um, if somebody is ill or whatever, there is a second rule, which is that only in that particular case, the side, the, the, the president's vote weighs heavier. We don't start with that, but if it is really one person ill, 10 on one side, 10 on the other side, then the decision will fall with the side where the president is. 
Now, all of this is not such a problem because we all have the opportunity to write uh, dissenting opinions, separate opinions and declarations. Uh, and so if you go through, particularly if you go through the dissenting opinions, you will see what the issues are where judges did not agree with one another. Now, uh, when I joined, when I was a new judge, I had, I had in mind not to start writing individual, an individual opinion, opinion straight away. Um, but then it was the North Star case. Now you may have seen there is a, a joint dissent of seven or eight judges in the North Star case, and I'm one of them, because this was a matter that was of such an importance to us. Um, now, there you can see, uh, it was a case with, in my recollection, with two ad hoc judges, so 23 judges, and quite a substantial group of them writes one joint separate opinion. That's a demonstration of a disagreement. And I, I would add to that, in the Dutch legal system, it's not possible to write dissents or separate opinions. You, you will only receive, this is the decision of the court, and that's it. You don't know if it was unanimous or whether it was just the majority had it. Uh, so for me, it was uh, also something to get used to. Um, it's not my tradition, but there you go. First case, I dissent. And uh, the second question, um, Professor Elizabeth, regarding the um, uh, comparison between um, this cases related to uh, boundary dispute. Um, how would you compare between the role of um, ICJ and uh, it was? Well, I would say that, um, uh, well, of course, the, uh, the ICJ has had uh, a number of um, uh, maritime boundary limitation cases, a li little bit more than the tribunal has had. Uh, now they have started to come to the tribunal, which is good. Um, and um, I think the way in which the judges perceive that case law is that we would tend to see more of a continuum. So uh, the perception of ITLOS is that we need to build on what the ICJ has done in our case law. We have already seen that the ICJ is also building on our case law, so sort of a mutual exchange. And particularly in the Bay of Bengal, where the first case went to ITLOS and the, the second case uh, went to arbitration, you also see that that is uh, that our case law is being picked up in arbitration. So yes, uh, different fora, but in terms of substance, I think that the judges, including the arbitrators, are more thinking about this as a continuum, as, as one set of rules, sort of a joint approach. Um, with, with respect to things like the three steps rule for the delimitation, etc. So, um, yes, um, um, it may look like different sources, but um, not too worrying, I would say. Thank you very much. And I think we still have one uh, a time for one more question. I see a hand from uh, Renata. Uh, yes, please, uh, Renata, would you like uh, to uh, ask directly to uh, Judge Lineset, please? Yes, Mr. Guzman, thank you very much for the opportunity. Professor Lainzat, I hope you are doing great. How are you, Professor? Fine, and you? I'm doing great as well, thank you very much. So, Professor, I would like to ask a question. Under the Article 44 UNCLOS states, have the duty to share information about dangers to navigation in international straits. But the problem is Indonesia does not want to cooperate by giving information about armed robberies which happened in our territorial waters, for example, in Malacca and Singapore Strait. So we are faced with a fundamental principle of international law, which is the duty to cooperate. So is there any possibility that it loss has uh, this jurisdiction to hear the case if Indonesia is sued by other uh, other states. Thank you very much, Professor. That was all my question. Thank you. Th that is an interesting uh, an interesting question. I, I would have a question in return. 
is, is there any specific reason why not? Have you gone into the uh, the politics of that decision? Was it a formal decision or is it just a weariness or something like that? But you, uh, I'll, I'll give you an answer first. Um, the um, that obligation um, under Article Forty Four um, is a uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, it doesn't say uh, inf provide information to the appropriate international organization, which is a formula you see elsewhere in other provisions in um, uh, uh, in the convention. It's not an obligation to provide information, for instance, to the United Nations. It is an obligation which is fairly uh, general, shall give appropriate publicity to any danger to navigation or overflight within or over the strait, etc., of which they have knowledge. Now, first of all, who would be, um, who would be the claimant? So neighboring states, presumably. And um, I would suspect that such a claim would not be a claim um, based purely on Article 44 in the sense of my claim is that there has not been any appropriate uh, publicity, but rather a number of incidents have taken place and a contributing fact has been the fact that although Indonesia knew that there were a bunch of pirates sitting in a particular corner. Although they knew, um, they never informed us about it. Now, in terms of facts, I think that is uh, a difficult factual position to demonstrate because you would have to demonstrate the direct link between uh, the, the presence of knowledge, uh, the absence of information and the incidents. If you would just want to take Indonesia to court for not providing information, that is very hard to substantiate. You, so I'm, I'm not certain how you would build that case. The other uh, element, of course, is what exactly is appropriate publicity? Now there we would have to go uh, to uh, the two main commentaries, uh, the, the, um, the Virginia commentary and the big book by Pearls. What did the drafters mean when they said appropriate publicity? For me, it would be something like a publication in uh, Notice to Mariners or something like that, or something uh, that is information that is put up in a big folder or a big poster in Indonesian ports. How do, how do you, you would have to have an idea about what exactly is the, the concrete implication of the obligation to give appropriate publicity. If we don't know that, I'm not sure a case is going to be very successful, but I would suggest that you at least have to have, you have to be able to demonstrate uh, incidents. I'm not sure, Renata, if that helps, but I would be very keen to hear from you. Well, uh, how exactly has this happened? Why is it that Indonesia is reluctant? This decision is not formally given by uh, the Republic of Indonesia, but the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia has stated that Indonesia will not give any uh, further information about piracy which happened in Indonesian territorial waters because uh, anything that happens in Indonesia, other states has no right to know about what happened. That's why Indonesia is um, not giving it, or uh, Indonesia is neglecting to share information to other states about all the dangers of navigation that occurs in our territorial water. And um, my question is also, is Indonesia, um, uh, creating a breach of international law uh, and especially in the duty to cooperate? Uh, duty to cooperate is not a is is uh, is not necessarily a very um, easy uh, 
um, obligation to substantiate in terms of when have you cooperated enough or when should you have done more? Um, so the very least uh, Indonesia ought to be able to demonstrate is that they have tried to um, provide appropriate publicity and then give examples, etc. So, so I would suspect there is a certain risk of an, one of the states in the region or a flag state who has suffered a particular incident um, and a, a, a ship suffered a particular inc incident, gets to the flag state, persuades the flag state to take the case to the tribunal. But that all will be will have to be based on, um, uh, on, on presenting appropriate facts from which it can be deduced that there has not been appropriate publicity. It's, it's not a simple case you're looking into. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor, for the answer. Thank you, Isnar Guzman. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rayad, for your question. Um, we are running out of time here, uh, but maybe uh, I, I just like will I just would like to inform you that uh, we still have one more question. Uh, maybe we can stretch uh, time a little bit. Uh, is uh, regarding um, perhaps maybe you have an opinion if we have a, a potential uh, dispute involving a non-state party to law of the sea convention then uh, what should we do about it? Uh, for instance, if we uh, have um, some kind of, uh, here the question uh, from Kirana asking about uh, potential uh, maritime border um, uh, disputes, but one of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the parties is not a state party to the law of the sea convention. Then uh, how should we uh, deal with a uh, case like that? And uh, one more here, uh, it's not a question, but it's more a uh, question on the substance, but more on the, uh, uh, from Amanda, whether uh, there is an opportunity in this time of uh, pandemic to have us uh, like online, um, perhaps training or internship at the uh, International Tribunal uh, for Law of the Sea. Maybe you have some information about that. Thank you, Lisbeth. Okay, um, now let me try to be quick. If if you have a problem with a non-state party, uh, and and you are still on speaking terms, and that's that's always uh, important. If you have a problem and you are unable to solve it by yourselves, it is always uh, possible for that other party uh, and yourself to take the case to ITLOS provided there is a compromis in which you decide this is our problem and jointly we are submitting this case to ITLOS and that your, your uh, substantive case will have to demonstrate why the rules of ITLOS that you are relying on would somehow also be applicable on the non-state -par non party to the, to the convention. I trust that is something that you will be able to do. Um, but it is possible, and it's also possible at the ICJ, to take a case to a court with a state that has not accepted the jurisdiction of that court or tribunal. And through the uh, compromis, uh, what they do is they will be accepting jurisdiction for this case alone. Um, and it's uh, normally we only talk about accepting jurisdiction in general. But there is also the lesser known, but frequently used in the ICJ possibility of accepting jurisdiction only for this case. And then you have access to a standing court. So you don't have to go through the trouble of finding the arbitrators, etc. So yes, you can do that. Um, but it very much depends on uh, the other side accepting. You cannot go on your own because that's gonna, you're gonna fall on your face instantly. As to um, internships, uh, etc. Yes, we have interns and I've seen two of them when I was at the tribunal a few weeks ago. We have three interns, two of them are in Hamburg and the other one is working from home. So uh, yes, have a look at the website. I think intern, internship positions are uh, advertised on the website, uh, itlos.org, very simple to find. 
um, and at the same time, uh, and that is also uh, something that we are now doing from a distance, I would advise everybody to have a look at the summer school of IFLOS, I-F-L-O-S dot org, I think, uh, which is a four week summer school in Hamburg uh, on law of the sea, but also maritime law. Very interesting to go to. Uh, and unfortunately this year again in the digital version. But uh, if you want to know more, that would be good fun, I think. Good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Lisbeth. So um, everyone, uh, I think uh, we, we can um, hear uh, now and the uh, lecture for uh, this uh, afternoon or, or evening. So uh, perhaps uh, would you please join me uh, to give a big kind of applause to uh, Professor Lisbeth Leinsen. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor, for sharing your knowledge and also for uh, sharing your time. We understand you are extremely <laughs> busy and so uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us. And uh, also for, uh, I, I think, uh, th this very, very uh, inspiring lecture uh, will encourage uh, our students to uh, learn about this uh, very important topic, uh, the information law of the sea. I would also like uh, to thank uh, uh, lecturers uh, who have uh, already uh, been uh, here with us uh, from the beginning until uh, the end of the lecture, Professor Eti Agus, uh, uh, Idris and also uh, Bu Florin and uh, Pagiri and also for um, our students here thank you uh, very much we have here about uh, still have about 70 uh, students uh, who are staying uh, with, uh, with us until the end of the lecture I would also like to thank the students for their support uh, for the technicalities of uh, this uh, international uh, guest lecture from Professor Elizabeth Lyson. So Lisbeth, uh, hopefully we can uh, see each other again next time, uh, next opportunity. Meanwhile, uh, take care, uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much once again. Uh, have a very uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening for everyone. And also, uh, selamat berbuka puasa. It's for those who uh, is going to break uh, the uh, fasting uh, soon uh, for the iftar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. From Lisbeth. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.